Everything that we need to know, giving us this daily briefing. We're expecting a major announcement concerning schools. Let's listen in. All to do in the last four to six weeks, and that was to go out to Stout Field and to watch our Indiana National Guard, our Indiana State Police, our Department of Homeland Security, and my pre emergency preparedness team from ISDH working together to pick and repackage all of the equipment and the, the supplies that we've received with regards to personal protective equipment uh, from our strategic national stockpile. It was our third and last, probably, um, uh, stockpile uh, PPE that we've received, but it was absolutely incredible to see so many Hoosiers out there working for the good of our frontline healthcare personnel that are taking care of our COVID-19 patients. It gave me an opportunity to thank them. I wish that the healthcare personnel all over the state that will receive this could have been there to see the looks on their faces and to feel what I felt and that is how very proud they were to be paying a part of this bigger picture for addressing this pandemic across our state. At this time that there's no there's no indication that we're going to get any further strategic national stockpile. Um, the strategic national stockpile was designed to try to be able to help a few large cities, a few states that were having a disaster, not to help all 50 states having a reaction or having to respond to a pandemic in all of our states. So we are continuing to work to obtain as much personal protective equipment as we possibly can, whether that is homemade here in Indiana or things that we can buy across the United States and across the world. We know that needs will continue to increase across the state in coming days and weeks, so we're doing our very best to be prepared for that. As you saw today, we're now over 3,000 known cases of COVID-19 in the state of Indiana. And as of this morning, about 700 people are currently hospitalized in the ICU with suspected COVID-19 in our state because they've either tested positive or they're suspected. A total of 78 Hoosiers have lost their lives to this pandemic already here in Indiana. Our strike teams continue to visit long-term care facilities and correctional facilities across the state to test now over 313 people. And about 200 of those tests have been from long-term care facilities, with 76 of those individuals coming back positive, representing 29 unique long-term care facilities. This could have been a worker or it could have been a resident of that long-term care facility. We're working closely also with our long-term care partners in the Department of Correction to take appropriate steps to care for infected individuals and limit the spread of COVID-19 within those institutions. They include cohorting positive individuals in one location or making alternative housing arrangements when necessary. I also want to address the question about wearing masks in public. As you may have seen, the U.S. Surgeon General has asked the CDC to revisit whether wearing masks in public, public will help prevent transmission. I want to emphasize that we should not be out in public for very long, just briefly to go to the grocery store, to go to the pharmacy, to run across the street, to, to check on grandma and grandpa. Those medical masks that we have need to be saved for our providers our frontline people who are taking care of COVID-19 patients. If there are masks that individuals are making, I think that's a fabulous thing if you want to wear them. But right now, we don't have enough masks to mask 6.6 million Hoosiers in our state. So many people have stepped up to make those masks, and I encourage you to use one of those masks first if you decide to mask yourself. We still need to save our N95 and our surgical masks for healthcare workers and EMS who are in direct contact every day with COVID-19 patients. We can all help reduce our risk of transmission by avoiding our e touching our faces, by making sure that we are socially distancing, and please just continue to stay home a little longer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Box. Uh, even though our teachers and our students over these past few um, weeks have been apart. They've still been together in different ways. I've been so impressed um, by the creativity and the perseverance that both are displaying, the instruction that has been occurring that will need to continue. The one thing that we don't want to do is, is pretend that, like before, um, let's face it, some of our classrooms can be like Petri dishes. Uh, that's always just been a fact. Uh, we can't return, we can't deny the facts of the world we live in today, right now. And so the last thing that we want to do 
is kid ourselves about our kids' health and safety. And so I'll turn over now to uh, the Superintendent of Public Construction, Dr. Jennifer McCormick, to give us some updates on where we are right now and where we're going over the coming weeks. Sure. So thank you, Governor. First of all, I would like to thank the health care providers who are helping our families and our students stay safe. Also to our educators. I know this is a, a time that is um, something that we have not seen before, and I want to thank you for your efforts. To our students, hang in there. You're doing an amazing job, and we need you to meet us halfway. To our families, we have received a lot of correspondence. We understand um, that sometimes the situation is a hardship on your family, and I certain, certainly do not want to minimize that but it's going to take a collective effort to save lives and schools must do their part so today I am announcing that all k-12 schools in Indiana shall provide instruction via remote learning for the remainder of the 1920 school year schools shall not conduct in-person instruction for the remainder of the year and school buildings shall remain closed unless it was stipulated in earlier executive orders for purposes that are defined having said that we are also looking at the amount of instructional days that will be required for schools. Currently, there are two ways to meet that. One, if you meet the 160 days, because prior to Governor Holcomb allowed us to have a 20-day waiver, if you hit 160 days, regardless of what that instruction was, whether it was e-learning, expanded learning, extended learning, those 160 days will get you there. If not, from the time that the executive order is signed until the end of your calendar school year, you have to get at least 20 additional instruction days in. And how that looks is going to be defined locally, whether again it's e-learning, expanded learning, extended learning, or a combination of any of those above. Also, at this time, schools will be, per, will be required to permit by, or, or submit by April 17th a continuous learning plan. The department is committed to working with schools to make sure that those um, plans have some type of guidelines for you to follow, but it also signals to families and to students and to our policymakers what um, instruction is happening across the state and what that looks like. Our goal, given this very difficult situation, is to ensure that students have some type of continuous learning. It may not all be e-learning, but we are, we are hopeful that we can um, offer some type of continuous learning to all of our kids. Also, we will have to have a certified report that will be due at the end that will lay out what is in your plan. So we will be collecting that. And superintendents, we've been doing that for years. That will just look a little different, but that's not new. Graduation requirements, so seniors, here you go, and the families of seniors. I know we've been waiting for this information, and I commend um, the governor's office and state board staff for working with the department to get to this point. So graduates, we, our goal is to get you across that stage. And we know this isn't easy. You are sacrificing a lot of things that you were looking forward to for your senior year, and that does not, I am very cognizant of that. I have a senior at home as well in college, and he's foregoing a lot of the things he has looked forward to as well. So I personally understand that and um, acknowledge that this can be difficult. But for seniors, for the class of 2020, you will be required to have earned your credits, and for any course that you are enrolled in, will count toward that. So if you have earned your credits up to semester seven or in middle school and are enrolled, in courses that will get you across that stage, you will be recognized as a 2020 graduate at the conclusion of your calendar or the, your instructional year. If you have a graduation requirement exam that you are still required to take, obviously those assessments have been canceled, so we will not require that. That will be waived. So you have to have your earned credits and your enrolled credits. And again, our goal is to get you across the stage. If you are in grades 9 through 11 or a middle school student who is earning credits, you will need to continue to earn those credits in a traditional manner. So the, the issue of just being enrolled to get the credit, that does not apply to students who are earning high school credits in grades in, in the middle school or in 9, 10, or 11. Also, we have had a lot of questions about teacher licensing. 
Under this executive order, Governor Holcomb has extended the CPR requirement to September 1. We know we've had a lot of questions regarding what does that look like and how can we keep those licenses going at a time where obviously we need educators. We want to make it so that all those barriers are taken down to get folks in the classroom as soon as we can get back into the classroom. So the CPR issue, we have extended that till September 1. Those who are under licensing or renewal will understand that. Our team is committed to working with you. And also our emergency permit issue across the state of Indiana will be addressed in some flexibility. So I know the news I deliver today for some of you is not the news that you have been looking for, but again, all of us have to do our part. I appreciate the support from educators. We appreciate the support from families. Families, you can look forward to your own local schools giving you further guidance in this information. They will be in communication with you. But again, this is a very difficult time and this is a time we all need to stay together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCormick. Uh, earlier this morning, it was reported that nationally speaking, 6.6 .6 million Americans um, filed um, jobless claims. And certainly, Indiana is not uh, uh, immune to this um, repercussion of COVID-19 and what it's done to our workforce. Commissioner Payne, you want to talk about it's Thursday, so you're able to share numbers um, specific to our state and then talk about handling the volume, whether it be on you know the call center or the website, um, and how the staff is handling that. Okay, thanks, Governor. Uh, it seems like on a daily basis we, we continue to adjust to this new, unique atmosphere that we're in, and we're constantly reminded of just how unique it is. And numbers sometimes tell the story of how unique things are. As the governor indicated about the, uh, the jobless rate, we too in Indiana are not exempt from that. Uh, for the most recent number released today, it shows that we had 146,243 initial unemployment claims filed for last week, the week ending March 28th. Prior to March of this year, the highest number of unemployment claims that were filed in a one-week period, which was the week ending January 10th, 2009, was about 28,000. Contrast that to the two previous weeks of this month. The highest number of claims that we've had in any one month period, as I reported last month, I mean last week, was 157,000. The number of claims we've received in a one week, in a one month period, at the highest point of our downturn, uh, is what we may be seeing now on a weekly basis. We're also seeing an equally unprecedented number of claims, of calls. Already this week, we've had more than 210,000 phone interactions. Last week, we had roughly 158,000. The weeks prior to that paled in comparison. These numbers show not only the volume of claims and calls are unmatched in history, but the rapid increase is unmatched as well. Our goal is to ensure that people are able to file their claims and that we administer them as efficiently as possible. We've updated our Unemployment Insurance Administration infrastructure to accommodate all of the changes that were made in the governor's executive orders related to COVID-19 over the past two weeks, including waiving the one-week waiting period and waiving all late fees. Let's be clear, people now do not have to worry about missing a deadline for filing for their benefits. Over the past few years, we've been updating and evolving our unemployment infrastructure. And we're going through these high claims numbers and these, this high volume. This system is allowing our claims to be processed efficiently. The processing of those claims, getting an initial claim filed all the way through payment and issue resolution, is moving along, along at the pace at a rate that it should. In fact, over the last two weeks, we've made approximately 169,000 unemployment insurance payments. Next week, we'll roll out an additional option for people to apply for benefits over the phone. We're aware that people may need this additional option, so we're providing that. However, the online computer option will remain the fastest way to apply. So we are having some challenges. 
There are two areas of challenge that we are addressing. One, the high call volume. Because of the large volume of calls we're receiving, people are experiencing long wait times. Or they may even have challenges getting through at all. To address this concern, we're hiring more people to assist with our call center, the more people and more people to assist with claims administration. In fact, we started this hiring prog prog process a few weeks ago in anticipation of this increase. We've redeployed people across our agency for claims administration. We're also continuing to request that potential claimants review the material on our website prior to calling. Many of the questions asked uh, that they have can be answered there. We update the site almost daily, adjusting to the most common questions people are asking. This option may provide more answers in a more quickly manner uh, than calling. Second, we're focusing on the implementation of the add-ons of the unemployment insurance coverage uh, from the federal government. As you may recall, last week, the Federal CARES Act was signed into law. Within a 24-hour time span, our UI team, our unemployment team here, executed agreements so that the state of Indiana could be eligible for every potential benefit at the onset. The law includes categories of workers that state systems do not cover, which include unemployment insurance coverage for independent contractors and self-employed individuals and others. The law also includes an additional $600 per week payment for individuals for four months. So how does this relate to our call volume? We're receiving a high number of calls related to these benefits that fall into about three buckets. Requests for information on how to apply for coverage. Situations where a person applied for regular benefits and was denied and wants to know how this affects their federal benefits or someone wanting clarification on what time frame a person should expect to receive these benefits. Our federal government, through the U.S. Department of Labor, is working on guidelines for states to implement this new coverage. We're also working to ensure that once the Department of Labor issues those guidelines and gives us and other states the green light, we're ready to implement and move forward. Also, as it relates specifically to the $600 a week benefit, the guidance and subsequent implementation and payment may not occur any sooner than May. Our guidance for those who will be covered under the new Federal CARES Act is to know that we are working to get, to get those benefits to you as quickly as possible. Once the federal guidelines are in place, we will move quick, quickly. We're asking for your patience. We'll inform you when the process for implementing these new benefits is complete, and we're ready to process applications. Finally, regardless of whether an individual is an employee of a company and out of work, of a company or out of work, uh, or a person who is an independent contractor or self-employed, or fall within any category of person eligible to apply for unemployment insurance benefits, we have waived deadlines for your filing. We're trying to ensure that those who are eligible are not left out because of COVID-19. We're having information sessions to the public through a variety of media platforms. We already have several webinars planned and a Facebook Live session uh, scheduled for next week. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Payne. Um, another obviously sobering day to digest numbers, both in terms of how many days apart our teachers and our um, students are sobering in terms of those unemployment claims that are being made in an hourly daily basis sobering in terms of the number of deaths that are occurring you know you, I, I looked at this earlier this morning 947 deaths in um, reported in just this last day across America and the number before that, the day before, was 847 on Tuesday. There's over 5,100, and it's, you, can just, you can follow the death rate go up and up and up and up and up all across the country um, on an hourly basis. Obviously, Indiana, again, is not immune to this. Um, you, you heard Dr. Box talk about the 13 families that lost someone that they loved over the last 24 hours. 
Um, it's continuing, COVID-19 is continuing to spread. We're up to 84 counties, so that number is going up as well. So whether you're in an urban dense area or a spread out rural area, we're looking at a map right here on this table of 92 counties. It's in 84 of our 92. And almost daily, we add one or two or three. So the spread is continuing and it's not slowing down. It's not slowing down across the world. Um, certainly not across America's landscape. And by the way, if you're starting to act when you see the spread, it's too late. It's already, it's already moving its way across your community. As I said um, yesterday, the, the things that we are doing today, right now, they're making a difference. The, the, our behavior, the way we've changed our behavior, the, the, our strength, our resilience, our perseverance, um, Obviously, that slogan is more than a slogan in this together, but that is what will get us through this, is being together. And so I just want to um, underscore that everything that we're doing, these three announcements that you just heard or updates that you just heard, these are dealing with the facts on the ground um, as they unfold. We are not going to be figuratively or literally whistling past the graveyard. We are gonna be taking the steps that need to be taken um, in the state of Indiana and tending to our, tending to our business. That I, I wanna also say that COVID-19 does not distinguish, I said it doesn't discriminate yesterday, it does not distinguish between different groups of people. It, it looks at 50 people at a concert, it looks at 50 people at church, it looks at 50 people at a college or in the first grade or on a cruise ship, the same. Every single person is a potential vessel to move this or spread COVID-19. And so we just have to make sure that we are keeping the unity in our community. All 92 counties, we're in this together. That, I just can't stress that enough that the steps that we're taking, washing your hands with soap um, religiously, social distancing, if you're experiencing symptoms, um, self-isolate before you're isolated in a hospital. We are um, sailing through a storm in, in uncharted waters. I, we've just never seen anything like this. I, Dr. Sullivan um, shared with me a study um, going back to 1918, the Spanish um, flu and, and the impact it had on all 50 states, um, including Indiana, including Indianapolis. Back then in 1918, we were kind of held up as an example, quite frankly, for um, the steps that we were taking. Same jargon, same language, talking about staying at home, um, talking about that social distancing, those steps, making sure that we weren't prematurely pulling back and seeing another another bump uh, or trend up in, in cases. And lots changed since 1918 in the world, certainly in, in our country and in our state. And so, yes, we may be sailing on uncharted waters. There may, ne there may not be a ship's log or there may not be a weather map or there may not be a current sea lane um, guidance out there, but I'll tell you, we, we do have a compass. We do have a moral compass. And that is focused on our neighbors. That is focused on each and every one of us and the steps that we can take. And so you can, you can count on us continuing to be a unified force in taking the steps necessary so that we can get through this as, fa as fast as humanly possible. It's gonna take teamwork. And uh, that's gonna require 6.7 million Hoosiers as well. So we thank everyone that is playing such a critical role uh, while you are hunkered down. And like we said yesterday, we understand that's, um, that brings some inconvenience with it. Um, but uh, we're gonna continue to try to make lemonade out of these lemons during this time. And we're seeing such good examples up in uh, DeKalb County and in Butler, Indiana, um, the, the school there east Eastside High School, you know, found out that they had some iPads on the shelf that weren't being used. They'd been updated and they got those to the nursing home. So now all of a sudden 
grandparents can, you know, FaceTime and Zoom and, and be in touch and see grandkids' birthdays. It's just these are the acts that are um, happening all over the state of Indiana in Wabash, um, Indiana, career, another school, a career center at a vocational school is using all of their 3D printers that used to be used for a different purpose um, to help make PPE. I mean, this is what Dr. Box just talked about. These are, these are schools that are going up and beyond uh, the call of duty. And, and that's what is encouraging to all of us is that we're showing here in Indiana how we're gonna, how we're gonna use our compass and sail through this storm and, and arrive in a stronger place um, for it. So with that, I'd be happy to, or we've got the whole uh, task force with us again today. So you heard about three um, subject matters that are of concern to all of us. Um, but if there's another question, Rachel, um, fire away. We begin with Elizabeth from PBS Michiana. Yes. Good afternoon, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, thank you for this update and for taking my question. My question is for Dr. Box. Dr. Box, you suggested that Hoosiers should go outside only briefly to run to the store or pick up essential supplies. What advice would you give to individuals and families who wish to go outside for walks, runs, or bike rides as part of their strategy to maintain their mental and physical health during this staying at home and hunkering down period? Thank you for calling me on that. I've said this a number of times and I 100% agree with you. There's nothing better than getting out on a day like today when the sun is shining, when it's okay to be out in just your vest and your t-shirt and to be able to get outside. It is so, so helpful for your mental health. And exercise throughout my whole life and through many people's lives is the way that we kind of relieve the tension, right? We kind of get the stress out by going and working that out. So I encourage you strongly to do that. I 100% agree. I think our state parks are still open. I encourage you to go out and hike the trails, walk around the pond, sit together, but six foot apart. You know, make sure that you are separating and don't do it in large groups. Don't have a family reunion where 100 people come, right? It's just for the nuclear family to go out and do that. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Thank you, Elizabeth. Erica Heron, the Indianapolis Star. Hello, Erica. Hi, Governor. Thank you for taking my, my question. Um, I'm just wondering, with the announcement that schools are now closing to the end of the year, what is the state doing to ensure equitable access to education while the schools are closed? Are you providing any additional resources to schools or considering bringing kids back early? So, Erica, this is um, Dr. McCormick. I appreciate your question. It is a concern. It's a real concern that you are expressing. I think um, the continuous learning plan will help address some of that. And also, we are collecting information and targeted data to help our team get resources to where they better need to be. It is tricky because there are folks who are trying to work from home. They've got three children. They're all doing e-learning. They've got one computer they've got some access, or they're being told, go to McDonald's and figure it out, get the access there, so it's tricky. We also have those who are doing paper, pencil, packets, and we now have the issue of some families don't feel comfortable with that exchange because of the physical part of that. So it is, there's no one size fits all with districts. We are very concerned with our districts that have basically closed and are offering no supports. That's very limited, but we do have some that are out um, across the state, so we are targeting those schools to say how can we be better partners we also have some philanthropic folks that have reached out to say how can we help and that is an area that we could really use some help in another concern that we're running up against is even if schools want to start doing a lot of um, remote type of learning everything's on back order, whether it's um, the hardware, MiFi's, I mean it's very very difficult so we understand the concern and we're working hard to address that Eric Berman, WIBC. Hello, Eric. Hello, Governor, good afternoon. Um, Dr. McCormick, just on the same subject, two related questions. You, you said in your opening remarks that you wanna see some type of continuous learning, but maybe not e-learning. Can you clarify for me the distinction between the two, what would be continuous learning that's not e-learning? And secondly, and relatedly, 
for those districts you just described where it's difficult having the hardware to do e-learning, how are they to hit that 160 days that you said is still going to be required? Uh, that's a great question. So e-learning in Indiana from prior years has really been defined as more of the um, using a learning management system and using the hardware of a device. So we have about half of our districts that are one-to-one. -one, that's one device per one child. And uh, we have about 85% of our districts that have a learning management system. So we have a lot that are equipped and have used e-learning in the past. So those districts are in much better shape, to be honest, than those who may be haven't used e-learning in the past um, for whether it's inclement weather or very short term. So the short term versus the long term is looking very different. And I think your families would tell you that, our educators would tell you that, and we would all, the department and uh, many people would tell you this long term piece just feels different, looks different, and brings some different um, barriers and opportunities as well. So the e-learning is pretty much defined with a device, with a learning management system, and it could also have some supporting materials along Along with that but it's very geared toward online online learning some folks are doing an expanded learning or an extended learning where they have a hybrid of packets um, or along with the e-learning depending on the district depending on their homes we have some communities that are heavy Amish and that brings its own challenges as well so there are just so many interesting factors that are happening with it but e-learning is more traditional really truly with a learning management system and hardware the other is more traditional feel where some folks say well it's just basically homework going home. Districts are getting pretty creative on trying to use um, most families have a television they may not have a computer they may have a iPhone so what do we have what do we have out there that we can really ramp up those resources we are also very cognizant that we're looking at how can we get a, um, instruction um, and or support systems in our homes that maybe it's very simple as far as um, books not all of our families have books at home and sometimes we are requiring assignments that deal with a physical a physical book and so we are looking at as a department again how can we get resources and tools into the hands of those students and those families but I do not want to diminish the hardship this is causing for some because I know we have a lot of families and I give them credit and Governor Holcomb has mentioned this if you can stay home if it's possible stay home and so a lot of our families are now working from home with multiple children e-learning at home and so that brings um, some interesting dynamics to it that we're, we're very aware of so but the diff difference between that can get very blurred based on the districts Michael WBEZ hello Michael hello governor um, thank you very much for this again um, um, I do this uh, the, well my first question is for dr. Bach where you know in terms of testing why does it seem that Indiana is still lagging behind neighboring states, including Illinois, in the number of testing that's happening for COVID-19. And my second part is for uh, Governor Governor Holcomb. You know, I, you're making the point about people staying at home and the schools needing to be shut down, but I still see a lot of social media postings and people conjugating outside, people saying it would have just been better to leave the economy up and running and schools up and running than killing the economy. What do you say to people like that? So I'll start with the question, <laughs> the testing question, because it's a lot easier than that one. But realistically, when we look at Illinois, a big part of their testing, and I don't know what the percentage is, is, is from the Chicago area, because Chicago's been a hot spot. It was one of our F-11 airports where individuals who returned home from a lot of these areas were quarantined and isolated. So there were a lot of tests, and still are a lot of tests that are being, being done up there because of the fact that they're a hot spot. Indiana, honestly, has had to work with um, some somewhat limited resources and many of the tests that we're doing are because our labs and our local homegrown folks have come up with uh, ways for us to test here yeah i i would just um say don't be a denier uh, don't don't deny the facts uh, covid 19 is spreading across this country, spreading across our state, as I just tried to articulate, um, at a scale and pace that is unprecedented. And if, if you want to destroy an economy long term, then don't deal with the virus. 
We have to deal with this. We're living in a, in a virus, you know, economics right now. We have to make sure that we have the ability to treat those who need care. We have to make sure that we're doing everything we can to flatten that curve and to slow the spread to the best of our ability. That requires behavioral change, absolutely for sure. That requires us to be responsible and not send kids into a classroom, not send uh, our workforce into uh, non-essential jobs so that they become spreaders, so that we exacerbate this. That's like pouring fuel on a fire. And for those who are ignoring this reality, you're costing other people, you're causing other people harm as well, and you're prolonging this. Everything that we're doing is trying to get us through this period. And we don't have a vaccine right now, and we're not waiting on that. We have to change our behavior now. And so if you're um, ignoring um, this guidance, both from our federal partners, from our state partners, from our local partners, um, it's at your own peril, but it's also at everyone else that you love and is around you's peril. So get with the program. Kayla Sullivan, Fox 59. Hey, Kayla. Hey there, Governor. I was wondering, after learning Dr. Ramuletti tested positive for COVID-19 from community, I was wondering if you have been tested or you plan to be tested soon, um, if you've been in direct contact with him. Um, I, I'm not showing any symptoms. Again, I, I mentioned this uh, previously that I've got doctors that are looking at me um, constantly. Um, and, and I'm practicing what they've preached, and that is if you are exhibiting or showing symptoms um, or have found yourself in a room with someone knowing that has been tested positive, I have not been in the same room with Dr. Ram Iletti. My um, thoughts and prayers are going out to him um, right now um, since the 19th, I think it was. Um, so I'm not in the um, um, scenario that would prompt me to go get tested, so I have not been. Don't plan to be unless I started to show symptoms. And then if, you know, the odds are I'll get through it, um, just like most uh, uh, Americans and, and folks around the world at my age and in my health. I'm not, I'm looking toward that, but, uh, but Dr. Romuletti doesn't concern me at this moment. For my health, he concerns me, but not for my health. Andy, Daily Journal of Johnson County. Hello, Andy. Andy, you have to unmute your own microphone. Hi, do you hear me now? We can. Okay, great. Uh, I had a question about education. I wanted some clarification on the contrast between requirements for high school seniors versus other grades. Uh, that was mentioned briefly. And then I also want to ask if graduation ceremonies <laughs> will be shut down or if schools will have a certain date that can hold them after. Obviously, that's an important thing for those seniors. Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, regarding the credits, so for our seniors, given, given that they're cohort 2020, we're looking at those credits a little differently. So if they were enrolled for the second semester, and again, 75% of the school year was completed, but for second semester, if they were enrolled in a course, they will get credit um, they will get the credit. So they are gonna, that will be recognized. If you are a middle schooler or a ninth, 10th, 11th grader, and you are continuing to work in that credit, we certainly will issue that at the end of the school year. And that's not up to the Department of Education, that's your own local school. But for some reason, if your school deems that they are struggling to get you instruction and um, they don't feel that that is credit, your work has been credit worthy, that is up to the local districts um, to not necessarily earn that credit. So your high schools will work with you. Again, 75% of the work has been done. And for second semester, you've got about half 
way there. So the credits are really up to the locals to decide. There are, in, in Indiana, there are provisions in place for test out options as well to show that competency. So the local level has uh, a lot of um, options for the middle school and 9, 10, 11. So I feel confident local schools will work with our students. But for high schoolers, we're saying if you were enrolled, we are giving, basically giving you the credit so that graduation piece is taken care of. And I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part? Ceremony. Oh, graduation ceremonies. Okay, so those milestone moments are going to be tough. So here's what I will say. If you are upset at anybody about this situation, you can be upset with me and please target that to me because I need you to be good partners with your local schools. They are going to do the best they can on being creative on what that looks like. I know I've heard from people you're missing your proms and you have your graduation ceremonies. And I understand those milestone, milestone moments are important and I'm not trying to diminish that at all. I think schools are trying to get creative and now that this announcement has been made, they're gonna have some tough decisions and they're gonna to have to look at some options um, regarding what that looks like. It's gonna look different, um, but we are working with the districts and again, that's a local decision. The department has no business getting in the middle of that, um, but we will offer that support. But if you're gonna be upset with someone, be upset with me and support your local schools. Nikki Kelly, Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette. Hello, Nikki. Hi, Governor. Um, I actually had a question for Dr. Box. Um, Allen County is one of the larger urban areas in the state, but seems to have a pretty low number of cases and deaths. And I just wondered if you had any idea why, if they're doing something different, or if maybe they're not testing as much. Well, I think Allen County has experienced barriers to testing just like all over the rest of the, the state. So I, I wouldn't be surprised that they have had some um, struggles with that. But um, I've had multiple conversations with Allen County, and I think they're feeling very blessed that they haven't had big outbreaks at this point in time. Uh, but I think they're feeling the calm before the storm. Sarah Clifford, the Brown County Democrat. Hello, Sarah. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Wonderful. I wanted to ask, Brown County is a place where a lot of folks go to socially distance, to enjoy a state park, to uh, rent a cabin or whatnot, but should folks really be traveling to do that, do that sort of thing outside of their own home counties? Was that really what you intended with your executive order? Well, we left the state parks open for people to you know, exercise at a safe distance, and they're spread, most of them are spread out around the state to where hopefully, um, you know, they're closest to home that you would have access. We're not encouraging people to take day trips and make multiple stops to, to go out and exercise. And so you don't need to make it a point to go, you know, like, a, like you got a passport and you're checking off going to every single state park this year, not at this time. We want you to do that. Um, at a later date when it's safe to do that. But if you live close, state parks are ideal places to go in and, and take, a, take deep breaths and contemplate and reflect and um, get some exercise in. But you can also do that you know, by running around the block um, once or twice a day. Abdul Hakim Shabazz, Indy Politics. Good afternoon, Abdul. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, can you folks hear me okay? Loud and clear. Uh, two things real quickly. One, Dr. Box, uh, obviously we've had some issues with nursing homes uh, in Indiana. Are we doing anything or looking at group residency homes for some maybe our younger folks with developmental uh, disabilities or other special needs? Uh, and for you, Governor, uh, you talked yesterday about an economic relief package. Obviously, this news we got with uh, you know, uh, the unemployed uh, small businesses. Uh, can you give us any insight as to what economic relief the state uh, may be offering? Sure. So those uh, same strike teams that I talk about that go out to long-term care facilities, to residential facilities, rehab facilities, are available for any type of a group home and that same type of education from an infection prevention standpoint. And really that same message that if you're sick, please do not go to work, stay home. If you're sick, please do not take part in those activities within those group homes. It exists for, for them just like in a long-term care facility. So yes, we are, we are are engaged actively with group homes across the state. And Abdul, for the, in regards to the question you asked me, um, there, there's, we, we look at this globally. Um, we look at this in terms of our partnerships with the, you know, a local community, 
with our federal partners. Um, having just passed phase three, this is significant. We're still making sure that uh, we understand all the pieces and how they'll snap together in terms of making the connection with um, the employer and the employee. So you come at it from two different directions, but three levels of, of government. And so what the state of Indiana has first and foremost done is we've tried to take every step that we can because we're on solid footing, um, fiscally speaking, going into this storm. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, we we are lessening the burden on Hoosier taxpayers. So that's why we've been able to delay property taxes or filing your income taxes to also align with what the what the feds, our federal partners did. Um, and then pushing back as uh, as many, you know, registration fees and licensing fees, et cetera, that, that may be due and would hit your, your paycheck. Um, but also then making sure, and you'll hear more about this, Abdul, next week, making sure that our Indiana Economic Development Corporation, who's turned into the, you know, one of their new roles is being a concierge for businesses that are trying to make sure that if they're applying for an SBA loan and, and understanding working with their local bank, whether it be a, a big bank or a community bank, um, that there are incentives to keep uh, Hoosiers, employees, on the payroll and uh, have that loan forgiven, for example. This, is some, this was a um, significant achievement by our federal partners on both sides of the aisle, I should, I should mention. Um, and so, Abdul, you'll hear more about kind of the, the bridge package, the economic recovery package, and how the local, what locals are doing right now. I've mentioned in previous uh, press conferences what Evansville has done. We talked about a couple days ago what Indianapolis has done. There are efforts all over the state of Indiana, all throughout northern Indiana as well, uh, whether it be a chamber of commerce or a city or multiple counties that have come together. Uh, to provide relief to. I talked about Madison, Indiana a couple weeks or a week ago, um, what they've done. So putting all the pieces together, this is just as important um, uh, as is the health and safety ramifications. The economic ramifications are immense and we get that, but we have to make sure that all the pieces um, snap together, fit together appropriately. So, Abdul, to answer your question more specifically, you'll have a lot more clarity on what the Indiana Economic Development Corporation and the Department of Workforce Development, how we're um, rolling out our programs for both the employer and the employee. Jacqueline Ryan, the Stark County Leader. Hmm. Hello, Jacqueline. Hello, Governor Holcomb, can you hear me? We can. All right, thank you for taking my question. Um, it's kind of unrelated to what you guys have been addressing so far, but it, it still ties into it. Um, just with the state's stay-at-home order and the restaurant dine-in ban coming to an end um, on Monday, I was just curious to know if there would be any state-regulated guidelines that will be issued for restaurants and businesses, or if there have been any discussions about maybe extending that. I, I hope you uh, tune in tomorrow at 2.30. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have All an right. update for you specifically on this question. Okay, thank you. Uh, it, and, and by the way, um, we're doing that. It's a good question. And, and I'm doing that um, tomorrow because we're going into a weekend and we don't want to wait until the 12th hour um, to, to uh, address this on Monday. And so we'll, we'll give some guidance. The executive order that we'll issue um, won't necessarily come out tomorrow, but we'll, we'll – um, provide some direction tomorrow before we go into the weekend. Thank Thanks, you. Jacqueline. I'll be back in tomorrow. Thank you. Lindsay Ardoti, the Indianapolis <laughs> Business Journal. Hello, Lindsay. Hi, Governor. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions in regards to unemployment. Um, Commissioner Payne mentioned that uh, DWD is hiring more people to, to help with the volume. So I'm curious how many people are being hired and how quickly are they being onboarded? And um, you also mentioned um, waiting for some federal guidelines uh, to come down in terms of um, how to deal with the extensions uh, afforded to unemployment. Um, but I'm curious, does that apply if, say, an independent contractor or a freelancer applied for unemployment right now? Yeah. Would they be denied because you're still waiting for that guidance or would, do they still have the opportunity to be approved? 
So, uh, thanks for your questions. Uh, the first question, uh, we have actually authorized a hiring of about 77 people right now. We started interviewing people um, quite some time ago. The first wave of new hires will be in sometime next week. Uh, on your second question in terms of uh, the benefits package with uh, independent contractors, if they apply on our system right now, our system will recognize them as being applicants under our old system, which did not accept independent contractors. So we are having to update our system, and when the federal guidance comes out, uh, we'll actually uh, uh, implement those. So if an individual now goes to our system and they're an independent contractor or they're self-employed and they apply, they will get denied. But we're making sure that we have that denial in sort of a holding pattern so that those individuals don't have to reapply once we implement the federal uh, guidelines. Emma Kate, Chalkbeat. Good afternoon. Hi, my question is for Dr. McCormick. Um, what does this mean for next year in terms of remediation or summer school for students? And how do you think this will affect the inequalities in education for some of the state's most vulnerable students, um, such as special education, ELL, um, or homeless students? So good afternoon, Emma. I think that's a great question. So we know that depending on how long the situation lasts, per se, summer school may look different, next fall may look different. But we also know, too, we need to target our services. So the federal government is looking at sending some help to the states that um, we will be working with the governor's office and what, what do those services look like. Our goal is to target as much as we can to those at-risk populations. Our districts have been working really hard to make sure that our um, students who are identified in those three populations are really receiving the, the services that they deserve um, and that they need. So we understand the concern. There is no magic answer to this right now. It is very complex. It is very difficult. Our team's charge is to identify those areas and make sure they are getting the resources that they need. So it, it is, we're very cognizant of that and we're trying to um, address that concern. Yeah, and I, Emma, um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Sullivan um, to step up to the plate, if you would, and address part of the, the vulnerable, uh, the most vulnerable among us, and how we go forward making sure those connections are still met. Good afternoon, Dr. Jennifer Sullivan, Secretary of the Indiana Family and Social Services Administration. Thank you for the question around vulnerable populations. We have a multi-agency team that are specifically tasked for looking at how we tangibly attack and support health justice across those who uh, need us the most. Uh, one of the most mature of those processes is um, taking care of homeless individuals so that they can, uh, whether affected by COVID or not, um, safely shelter, um, isolate, and quarantine as needed. Um, that work is uh, actively in progress and open here in central Indiana and is replicating across the state as we speak. Uh, we have uh, found community partners to step in and help us with that and are also great for the work of the National Guard and the Department of Homeland Security, Security so that we can work with local municipalities to identify safe sites that are comfortable, um, allowing for food procurement and then also wraparound services for individuals uh, who are homeless so they can um, find the help that they need. We also are specifically uh, working with the elderly who need food services, uh, foster youth um, who need food services, and children as well with a great um, partnership with the Department of Education for Operation Food and distributing those services as well. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca White. Rebecca. Rebecca, you have to unmute your own microphone. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. This goes probably to Dr. Box. Um, are there any figures of numbers of recoveries in Indiana? And or also, are we getting any uh, figures on those who have tested, but tested uh, negative? 
We, we have some negatives that have come in, but we're not receiving all the negatives yet from around the state. Numbers that I do have for you, though, is um, I, we've been looking very specifically as we were talking with different regions around the state. We realized that a lot of hospitals were keeping track of exactly how many COVID suspected patients they have in the hospital and how many COVID positive patients they have. So we added that to our EM resource platform, and about 80% of our hospitals are now reporting on that. When we look at it with about 41 percent of our ICU beds available. We look at that, that um, remaining uh, uh, 60 percent and about 30 percent of those beds are being taken, care, taken up by COVID patients and about 30 percent by non-COVID patients, meaning somebody had a heart attack, unfortunately, or a stroke. And we're also looking at our ventilator um, access. So we are doing more uh, data gathering like that. Again, this concept of people that are admitted to the hospital and released as those ICD-10 codes, which again are the coding for people that are hospitalized with um, COVID-19 when they are discharged all of that will now start to download and we'll be able to have more data in the next week or two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our final question goes to Brandon Smith of Indiana Public Broadcasting. Hello, Brandon. Hey, Governor. Uh, this question is for Dr. McCormick. Uh, you mentioned that, that it will be up to local districts to decide how the credit, credit uh, will work for folks below high school seniors. Are, are some kids going to be looking at a scenario where they have to repeat a grade or at a minimum it's going to be harder for them to graduate on time so part of the goal with our continuous learning plans that are due in april is for us again to look at what those needs are our local schools are going to try to issue as many credits as they can based on if the student has earned them so our that's our charge to continue that education do we know do we think we're going to have gaps absolutely i mean i i'm not going to pretend that we're not going to have gaps the it becomes now how do we address the gaps k through grade 11 um, will be our new target it, obviously to say what are we going to do with that skill gap that obviously has come over the last few months and will continue on through the end of the year and then our concern again is summer into next fall so we know we will have some work to do but our local schools are very aware of that we're trying to look at capacity on this may look differently going forward it's changed a lot of things it's also uh, been an urgency call to many of our districts we'll know more on April 17th when we get those continuing learn continuous learning plans in but our goal is to look at our resources, understand our capacity so that we can address those gaps. Thank you for joining today's briefing. Governor Holcomb's next briefing will be tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. And we'll have that briefing tomorrow as well. Just a, a couple of notes that came out of it. Of course, the big news, the highlight that came out of this schools will be officially closed for the rest of the school year. As far as unemployment goes, more than 146,000 unemployment claims just within the past week. That's a 144% jump from the previous week. And you heard the governor there once again kind of hinting towards an announcement tomorrow that they might extend the stay-at-home order for the entire state for the rest of the month to kind of meet with the federal guidelines that were put out earlier this month. The governor also uh, sending a message out to Hoosiers in regards to COVID-19. He said, don't be a denier. More news coming up at 4 o'clock on All Indiana. We'll be back with you at 5.